We want to welcome all of you to the house of the Lord today. We're going to move right along here today. We've got a lot of things that we're going to be doing, and uh, we just want to keep things moving. But you know, as I look around, I see some faces that I haven't seen in well over a year, and it just delights my heart to see you back in the house of the Lord. God bless every one of you, and uh, just it's good to see the family back. And uh, we're glad that you're here. And uh, again, those of you that maybe are just joining us for the first time, whether you're here or online, today we're going to be doing service a little different because today we're going to be doing some baptisms and uh, we're going to be just joining with some precious men and women who are going, if you will, public with their faith. And then we're going to be celebrating communion. This is the first Sunday of the month and as we usually do we're going to be doing communion and then at the end we're going to be uh, asking all of the pastors and the elders and their wives to come up and we're going to anoint those who are sick among us today with oil and pray the prayer of faith because we still believe in a God that heals in his name hallelujah how many of you believe that today and so we're gonna do that so we're going to have a busy morning, but I, I love doing this. We do this four times a year, roughly, and we're so glad you took some time to be with us today. Before you're seated, though, I'm going to have you turn to your neighbor and just tell them you love them in Jesus' name, and then you can be seated. I don't know why my lights went out here. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to invite you very quickly to go with me to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and we're going to chapter 11. Some of you know that 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is where Paul speaks extensively about communion. And uh, last time we did this, I talked about baptism. Today, I'd like to focus our attentions more to um, that of our communion uh, portion of our service. And I, I was just really over the weekend thinking about one part of it. And this is in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 27. Paul says this, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him proceed in eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now listen to this. For this very reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep, and many of you know that that is a code word, if you will, for death. He said, some have died prematurely. Some have died before their time. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Isn't that interesting that he says, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So we know that at least to one degree, Communion is a time of judgment. Not a judgment or a wrath coming down, but rather it is a time for us to judge our hearts before the Lord. That's clear from the text. Isn't it interesting that Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Now, I am not in any way, shape, or form suggesting that Peter had communion on his mind when he wrote that. But at the very least, I have to accept that when we gather together and we celebrate communion with one another, that this is one way that God is judging his church. Can I hear a good amen? Amen. That, you know, it, rather than it always being this abstract judgment, that there may be very specific moments when the Lord is judging my heart. And again, not with wrath, but he's examining my heart. And communion would certainly be one of those moments. And that is why we are to enter into communion with a great sense of humility within our hearts. Father, would you just be with us over these next few moments? I'm not going to take a long time here, but... 
I know you've laid some things on my heart because I know you want to do a great work here among us. And earlier in this service, you've already manifested yourself to show us that you're ready to do something among us, provided that we will enter into this holy communion in a right heart. May we hear the voice of the Spirit, please. I don't want people to hear me, but I would love to for people to hear the Spirit and what He's saying to the church in this moment. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Can you just turn to your neighbor and tell him you'll love him? In Jesus' name. Seventy-seven years ago today, June 6th, in the year of our Lord, 1944, at 6.30 a.m., Central European summertime, 12.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 156,000 Allied troops stormed the beaches of Normandy. And they began their liberation of German-occupied Western Europe in an operation that is known as Overlord, but is more commonly known by us as D-Day. That would be the turning point in World War II, and many would say that it was the beginning of the end of Hitler's reign of terror. And I think that it would be good for us just to take a moment and remember the sacrifices that men made that day and the ensuing months to secure at least some sense of liberty throughout the globe for the glory and the honor of Almighty God. And I just think that it would be wrong for us to pass through this day and at least not remember that sacrifice that was made. It changed history, and we want to thank our God for those men who were willing to lay down their lives, not only then, but in those ensuing months until liberty was gained. At the same time, I think this morning it's good for us to remember that believers around the world have gathered in houses of worship in order to remember an even greater and more invasive liberating event. And of course, you know what I am talking about, and that is the fact that 2,000 years ago, Jesus the Christ, the eternal Son of the living God Almighty, became flesh and dwelt among us. Born of a virgin, Jesus invaded the darkness that had engulfed the hearts and minds of men and women since our fall in the Garden of Eden. And for three and a half years, Jesus advanced the kingdom of God in the earth as God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. For three and a half years, Jesus demonstrated his absolute total authority over all of creation and even the powers of darkness until finally, in one last battle, he took into his holy heart all of the sins of mankind and then laid down his life in a sacrificial manner upon an old rugged cross and died as a criminal even though just hours before he had been proven in the court of law that he was innocent of all the charges that were brought against him for the glory and the honor of his great name. It looked like and appeared to be his defeat, but actually it was the defeat of the enemy. As the apostle Paul put it in Colossians, and you and I being dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh, he is made alive together. Can you say he's made us alive together? He's made us alive together with him, having forgiven us of all of our trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. I still laugh when I hear Christians say, we got to defeat the devil, because I want to ask him, just how are you going to go about doing that, seeing that the Lord already 
already defeated him at the cross 2,000 years ago. You and I don't have to defeat the devil. He's already defeated. Can I hear a good amen? Can I hear a better amen than that? He's already defeated. And on the third day, Jesus arose from the dead victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Not only giving to mankind what was necessary for you and I to be saved from our sin, but so that we could be indwelt with the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead so that we could live the rest of our days as overcomers, more than conquerors in Jesus Christ, that our life would put on display the very power of God because the excellence of the power that is at work in us is not our own, but it is the power of God that is working in us in Jesus' mighty name. And so today I can say, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. I am thankful for men and women who gave their life for the natural freedom, but they can take that away. But I have a freedom in Jesus Christ that no one can ever take away. And I wish that the redeemed of the Lord would say so today. Is there anyone that would give him all the praise for that freedom that we have in Christ? And now the accuser of the brethren has no business being anywhere but under our feet in Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful for that hope we have in him today. Peter told us that we needed to judge ourselves in the house of the Lord. This morning, it's interesting, we have brought together the two ordinances that were instituted by Christ himself that the church was to continue to operate in and to function in until Christ comes again that will serve as reminders of this great liberty and freedom that we have in Christ. And of course, those two ordinances are baptism and communion. Baptism serving as an outward demonstration of the inward work that the Lord has done in us. As we go into baptism in just a few moments, we are reminded that in Christ Jesus, we have died to our sin. We have been buried in Christ, and we have been raised by the Holy Spirit to walk in the newness of life. Because now greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. But we do communion to remind us of the fellowship that we have with Christ and the fellowship that we have with one another and the need to examine ourselves from time to time to make, as Peter put it, our election and our calling sure. It it, it is again, and I want to remind you that communion is not where we're trying to decide whether we're saved or not. By the grace of God, you're taking communion because you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior. But rather, it was meant to be a time of examination to see where you stand in the Lord today. And Peter, again, told us that this judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. And and again, I'm not suggesting that what Peter was thinking at that moment was communion. But certainly, communion is a part of how God judges his church that we are always examining ourselves to make sure that we are ready for what he has called us to do in these final days of human history. This past week, Kathy and I <clears throat> were uh, at a wedding. I, I did this wedding. And during the reception, there was someone, not from Bethel, that knew I was a pastor, and they came up, and they were asking me uh, about the rapture. And they wanted to know if I believed in the rapture, but I knew what they were fishing for. As I started talking to them, what they were really wondering is, I, I hope that I'm going to get out of here before anything bad starts happening in this country. That's what they were fishing for. Well, I assured them that I do believe in the rapture. And I know that not all believers believe in the rapture, but all believers do believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We believe that he is going to come again and that the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and that he will rule and reign forever. But not everyone believes in the rapture that will happen before for that second coming. And that's all right. I've studied the evidence and I just firmly believe that there is a rapture that is going to occur before the second coming. If you don't, that's fine. You can stay here as long as you want to, but I'm going to go. <laughs> but, but I wouldn't split over that. But I did say to them that even though I do believe in the rapture of the church, I said, I do believe it's irresponsible to think that the rapture is going to miraculously deliver you from any hardship. Only in the United States of America would we be as arrogant to believe that the rapture is going to take us out of this world before anything bad happens. 
I believe that it is entirely possible that we will see some form of persecution, that we will see at least some form of tragedy and difficulty. And I'm thankful that throughout the New Testament, I see God allowing tests, allowing trials, allowing judgments, even communion, so that we can examine ourselves to make sure that we are ready to handle those days. Because let's be honest, if I can't handle the day-to-day stress and difficulties of life, what would ever make me think that I can handle the days that are ahead? It is amazing how so many people will pride themselves of being so strong in the Lord, but they melt under just the day-to-day difficulties. What are you going to do when the heat really gets turned up? How many of you know that in these last days we need to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are strong in the Lord and the power of His might? That in these days we need to know that we are spiritually fit and healthy and that we are alive in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that one reason that communion was given is so that we can honestly and humbly sit before the Lord and ask Him to show us the condition of our heart. It's interesting, Paul's assessment of this church in Corinth, speaking to them, he says that among you, you have many who are weak. Notice that word many. He didn't say few. He said many are weak and sick among you and many sleep. He says, I'm assessing this church in the city of Corinth, and as I assess it, I can tell you that many of you are weak, many of you are sick, and many have died early. They have died before they had to. Those aren't my words, so don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what Paul said. Paul said, I'm assessing the church, and that is the situation. And what is sad is that I believe that that could be the assessment of many within the professing church, even in this hour, that even today there are many who are weak. And as I was studying that over the weekend, I've always felt this way, but I really dug into it. And, And the weakness that he is speaking of here seems to lean more in the direction of a spiritual weakness, not a physical weakness. Though I think physical weakness is certainly implied there. It seems that Paul is speaking more about a spiritual weakness. Because it's a word that is used throughout the New Testament to describe those who are feeble. It's used to describe those who are without strength, and that can be physical, but listen, it's also used to describe those who are unable to achieve anything great. How many of you want to do great things for Almighty God, even if that is living a victorious and overcoming life over sin? About four of you. How many of you want to do great things for God? (laughs) Amen. And 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 he uses that word, weakness, to describe those who are unable to achieve anything great, of obedience in their life. He's talking about those who are destitute of power. Listen to this. It's used to describe those who are sluggish in doing good, just lazy, and just don't have any desire to live godly in Christ Jesus. It was actually a word that was used to describe those who lack the ability to make decisions and choices. And what Paul is saying is in assessing the church, there are many of you that that lack that strength. You don't achieve anything great. You're destitute of power. There's no desire to live a godly life. You're sluggish. You know what to do, but you just don't do it. And you lack the ability to make any godly decisions and choices within your life. And I wonder even here this morning how many of you would say, you know what, I don't like to admit it, but that's where I am. I just don't seem to be able to string together any kind of consistency in my walk with God. I don't know that I'm doing anything great for the Lord. I don't know that I really have a desire to live godly in Christ. And it seems like I'm lacking the ability to stick with any godly choice or godly decision. Paul said, many of you are like that. Then he talks about sickness, and that does seem to be dealing more with physical ailments and physical infirmities, that they are sick. And then, of course, he says in extreme cases, some of you have even died before you should have. And then Paul tells us why. You ready for this? He says, that's the condition that I see you in. You're weak, you're sick, some have died, and here's why. Verse 27, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord, say this with me, 
in an unworthy manner, say it with me, in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, which is just a way of saying that you're transgressing the body and the blood of Christ. Why? Because you take communion in an unworthy manner. Now, understand something. In general, none of us are worthy of taking the Holy Communion. Can I hear a good amen? The only reason we're worthy of taking communion is because of the grace of Almighty God. How many of you are thankful that through the blood of Jesus Christ you have been given direct access into the very presence of Almighty God? I am so thankful for that. So in general, none of us are worthy, but we've been made worthy through the grace of God and the shed blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We're thankful. But he's not talking about that. He's talking about about a very specific unworthiness. An ongoing willful condition that many within that church were experiencing. And he says it's because they continue to take communion in this unworthy manner that many are weak, many are sick, and many have even died before their time. Now let's be honest. We're uncomfortable with that. We really are. In fact, we just would prefer dancing around that scripture because of the implications that are there. And some would immediately say that the reason they're uncomfortable is that it makes it sound like all sickness and all weakness and all premature death is a result of taking communion in an unworthy manner. But that is not what he said. He just said many. He didn't say that all weakness, all sickness, and all death is a result of taking communion in an unworthy manner. But he did say it happens many times. Enough that any mature believer would want to say to themselves, if I see weakness in my walk with the Lord, and I just am getting sluggish, and there's no desire to do the right thing, and I can't make the right decisions and choices, and I don't have the power to achieve the great things that God has called me to, and if I am experiencing ongoing sickness and nobody seems to know what's going on, that maybe the best place for me to start is how I'm taking communion. Can I hear a better amen? Like All I hear is crickets right now. Because let's be honest, we just, come on, Pastor Kirk, can't we just go through one Sunday and make us feel really good about ourselves? I want you to, but but we're taking communion right now. And, And he says it's for this reason that many of you are weak, many are sick, and many have died. It would seem that if I were experiencing spiritual weakness of some kind in my life, if I were just continually just struggling with nagging physical issues, that at least I should start with communion in understanding what Paul said. Many are in this condition because they continue to take communion in an unworthy manner. Well, some of you are wondering, well, what is that? How do you take communion in an unworthy manner? He answers that in verse 29. He says, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner is eating and drinking judgment to himself. Why? Because he has not discerned the Lord's body. So he says that literally... um, Taking communion in an unworthy manner is not discerning the Lord's body. So now the question is, what does that mean? Because I want to make sure I'm not doing that. Well, it could be that we're not discerning his physical body. That could be. It's a possibility that he's talking about not discerning why Jesus offered his physical body upon the cross, not only for the forgiveness of our sin, but for the salvation of our sin, not just so that we could sin endlessly and be forgiven, but rather to be set free from our sin. And how many of you are thankful that sin no longer has to have dominion over us through the power of Jesus Christ? So certainly that is a possibility. The problem And I don't want to get all preachy on you here today, but the problem is that that is not the context of the rest of this chapter. It's really not even the context of the entire book of 1 Corinthians. He doesn't seem to be talking about the physical body of Christ. So the only other possibility would be that he was talking about the spiritual body of Christ, and who would the spiritual body of Christ be? 
the church. It seems that what Paul is talking about here is that you're taking communion and you're not discerning your relationship with other professing Christians and how you treat one another. And if you go through the book of 1 Corinthians, you'll hear Paul, he doesn't even get out of the first chapter without rebuking them for the division and the schisms and the factions that have developed in that church. The favoritism. How people look down upon others. In fact, look at this. Verses 17 and 18, then I'm going to drop down to 20 and 21. He says this. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better but for the worse. He says, I know that you're coming to do communion and you think it's for your betterment. Actually, it's for your worse because of how you're taking communion. For first and foremost, When you come together as a church, I'm hearing that there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. You're coming there saying you're eating the Lord's Supper, but that's not what is really going on. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. Now understand that they did communion back then much different than we do today. And I'm not saying that we have to do it the same way that they did it. Times were different. Cultures changed. We understand that. But you have to understand at least the context and what he's talking about. Back in those days, when they did communion, it was a big event. They would come together and they would have what they called an agape feast or an agape meal. And they would come together and they would just have a great time of fellowship and have dinner together and just have that fellowship with one another. And then after that, they would do communion somehow, however they did it. But that's, they made a big event of it. And there are one or two things that were happening that Paul was rebuking them for. He says, one thing that could have been happening, again, we're not sure, but it's one of two possibilities. It could be that everyone was to bring something to share. And what was happening is the elite, the educated, the well-off, the attractive, the popular crowd, you know, they would arrive first and they would eat everything. So that by the time the poor and the needy showed up, there'd be nothing for them. The other possibility was that um, everyone was told to bring their own meal for them and that they were to eat it together and then move into communion. And what was happening in that case is that the elite, the educated, the wealthy, the well-off, the attractive, the popular, they would bring in banquets. And they would sit in front of the poor who barely had enough to feed themselves, let alone their family. And rather than feeling compelled to give to those who were in need, the rich and the wealthy, the popular, the elite, and the educated would just eat it in front of them and not even consider the needs that were there. Any way you look at it, they were guilty of dividing the body. They were guilty of creating a class system. They were guilty of flaunting their blessings in front of those who did not have to make them feel less of a believer. They would gossip. They would talk about how, well, I know you were baptized by Peter, but we were baptized by someone greater than he. And they were just all into that. Judgmentalism. All of that was just dividing the church. And Paul said, this is why you're weak. This is why you're sick. And this is why some of you have even died ahead of time. Because you didn't discern the body of Christ, that it's one body, and that you're meant to be a blessing to one another. Well, it's quiet here today. Everybody wants to be healed, but nobody wants to actually look at what could be causing our illnesses and our weaknesses. And again, 
Is it all the time? No. But is it a good place to start? I would certainly think it's a good place to start. That I would look into my heart. You know, we sometimes forget God hates gossip. Am I, like, are you apparitions there? Like, God hates gossip. You say, well, what is gossip? If you're talking to someone about someone else and they are not the problem and they are not a part of the solution, it is gossip. And even when you say this, I'm only sharing this with you so you'll know how to pray, that is still gossip. If you share information with someone, if I got a problem with my wife, and I go to Mickey, and I say, Mickey, let me tell you the kind of wife that I have to live with every day. Mickey is not a part of the problem. She is definitely not part of the solution. I am gossiping. If I go to Mickey and say, Mickey, would you pray for me? Just going through a test, and I just need you to pray for me, that I would be strong in the Lord. That's not gossip. But the moment I interject a name, I'm gossiping. Because she's not part of the problem. She is not part of the solution. If I'm listening to someone and they interject a name and I don't stop them and say, don't give me any names. And I listen to it and I'm not a part of the problem and I'm not part of the solution. It's gossip. And it's bringing division. It's bringing factions. It's separating And folks, God hates that. I'm not saying he hates you, but he hates that because it's an offense. It's an affront to the grace of Almighty God. And Paul said it's for this reason that many are weak, many are sick, and some have died. You know what was on my heart, and I don't know if I dare to go down this road or not, but I would just even say that goes for all of your relationships. In your marriage, there's some of you that you think nothing of putting down your husband, your wife, talking about them. And you wonder why you are struggling spiritually, why you're struggling with physical ailments. And it could very well be that you've invited judgment in because you do not protect the body of Christ. Now again, if you don't like what I'm saying here, that's fine, but I'm just asking you to at least look at the Word of God and see if this rings true. Folks, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. And we were to be those who make peace, not those who bring trouble. Can you hear me? And I, I'm not saying this because there's anything going on. I, I, whenever I speak on these issues, I'm afraid, you know, that people are going to think there's something going on. No, there's nothing going on, at least not that I'm aware of. I'm just telling you that this was on my heart today because I believe that God wants to do great things. I, I believe that He wants to heal. I believe that He wants to set men and women free, but I believe that He has an order. And what God says is, It's not going to happen as long as you continue to take communion, saying that you have this wonderful wonderful fellowship with me, but you're in division with one another. And that's why he says in verse number 31, if we would just judge ourselves, then we would not be judged. If we would just take the time in, in communion just to humble ourselves, say, Lord, search my heart, that then you could receive that communion without fear. And that's why he tells us to let a man examine himself and then let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. I want to read just one last scripture. TJ can come up. Psalm 133, verses 1 and 2. Listen, you know it. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. 
And then he says, it is like the precious oil, which we know represents the Holy Spirit upon the head, running down the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. He said, you know, when my children dwell together in unity it releases the holy spirit's anointing and the prophet told us that it's the anointing that destroys the yoke of bondage how many of you know that what we're going through as a country right now can only be defeated by the anointing of the holy spirit by the power of god <laughs> And, and, and he makes it very clear that that begins when my people dwell together in unity. And so what I'm just simply asking here this morning is that all of us would just consider these words of Paul and just ask the Lord, you know, we're going to watch some wonderful men and women be baptized here. And, and we're going to celebrate their salvation. But I pray that as you're watching that, that you would be in a state of reflecting upon your own salvation. And as a child of God, that you have a responsibility to make peace, to, to create unity. And just ask the Lord, Father, have I been doing that? Have I been a peacemaker? Am I building up the body? Like, do I recognize the needs of, of other men and women around me? Or do I hoard all of the blessings of the Lord to myself and to my family? Ask the Lord to show you that. Because I want us to enjoy all that God has for us in these last days. I was sharing with someone last night. I do not believe that we as believers have to just struggle along in these last days, no matter how difficult they are. I believe that we can thrive even in the midst of these days. How many of you believe that? But, but I got to start, I gotta start with the, the, the simple things. I was thinking about it, and then I'm going to step out of here. And we're going to do those baptisms. But I was thinking about it this morning. We all are looking for that vicious, frontal assault of the enemy. We just think that when the enemy is going to come in, it's just going to be in this terrifying manner. And yet Solomon wisely said once that it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. It's the little things, the little compromises that we make in our lives. And folks, you know, many of us would think gossip's not a big deal. It is in the kingdom of God. Because a kingdom that is divided against itself cannot stand. So I pray that as we watch these who are being baptized today and we celebrate it, can we also be examining our hearts in a few moments we'll come back up and we'll do communion and then we're going to go right into prayer for the sick because I believe some of the greatest healing services we should have come right after communion when we've made things right in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, help us in the midst of watching these men and women dedicate themselves to you. Help us to search our own heart and to know that we are in the place that we were called to be in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless the Lord. Pastor John.
more than that, I pray that it would be a milestone moment for her, that she would look back and she would remember all that you have done in her life, that she would remember your countless blessings and your provisions, and she would know that in the darkest days, she can continue to trust you continue to turn to her. Lord, as she grows, may she grow in her understanding of who you are. May she grow in her walk and relationship with you. And may you truly use her, not just to be a great worshiper, but a great servant of the kingdom of God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next we have, this is Sophia Nelson. This is really crazy because I remember helping you in Kids Church and you're like almost taller than me right now. This is throwing me for a loop. But uh, this is uh, Scott and Teresa Nelson's daughter, um, their youngest daughter, and uh, we're just excited to be with her today. And again, I just thought, you know, Scott and Teresa are probably, and their entire family, some of the longest standing members here at Bethel Church. And uh, I just thought, you know, they've got... Um, incredible daughters, all of which are serving the Lord, all of which are serving in the church, not just here attending, they serve. I was at youth group Friday night and they were worshiping, they were leading worship, they were leading worship here in our adult service not long ago. And that is what can happen when we make church and the kingdom of God a priority in our homes. When it's not just something we do on Sundays when we can, but when we come faithfully and commit to the kingdom of God. And I believe, Sophia, that you are a testimony to that. So can you give God praise for that if you believe that? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Sophia, what is your confession of faith this morning? So I was going to be baptized before, and so, like, I couldn't. And so I realized that maybe it wasn't the right time. So one time in youth group at, on a Friday night after worship, I just felt like I needed to worship God again. So all of a sudden, God let us worship again, and I just felt his movement, and just like, now I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen, amen. Would you give God praise for that? Would you extend your hand out as we pray for Sophia? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And again, I thank you for Sophia. And I thank you that again, at her age, she is sensing the presence of God in her life. Lord, I believe I was talking to an individual who was much older yesterday and they were just asking me, you know, how do I know that God is with me? How do I even sense his presence? And I'm just thankful that here as a teenager, she's already sensing your presence. She's sensing the moving of the Lord in her life. And I just pray that no matter where life takes her, she would never stop being sensitive to your voice. Never stop being sensitive to what you are doing in her life. I pray that you would continue to mold her, grow her, and strengthen her in her faith. Continue to use her, not just here in Bethel Church, but use her in her school. Use her wherever life may take her. And I pray that when it is all said and done, no matter where she is, it would be known that Sophia is a child of God. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Next we have, this is Jamel, and uh, I've had the chance to meet Jamel a couple of times. Uh, her and her children started attending here once we reopened, right, after, after some of the COVID restrictions, and uh, I don't think that they have missed a single Sunday since then. She's actually going to be starting to serve in our children's ministry very soon, and so we're just so excited for her and for her family, amen. 
And Jamel, today, what is your confession of faith? Um, I confess that Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. When I started to follow Jesus, I know um, it delighted me for some reason. It ju just brings joy in my heart. And I know that Jesus is, um, his love for me is, and for everyone else, is overflowing. It's uh, sustaining um, so many things that I can't even think of. So each time, I don't really want to put him on the cross again because that's what I learned in the atonement. So I don't want to put him on the cross again. So each time the enemy lures me to or tempt me to sin, I just close my eyes and swap to Jesus. I don't trade place with him. There's no way I can do that. But I stand, walk away from temptation, and pray to Jesus. So I know I'm still work in progress, but wherever God, I know that wherever he puts me, I will bloom there wherever he plants me. Amen. Amen. Would you, extend your, would you extend your hand out to Jamel? Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jamel. I thank you for bringing her to our church, not because our church is perfect, but because it gave her an opportunity to call upon the name of Jesus. And Lord, you know what she said there at the end, she's not perfect, but guess what? None of us are. Lord, we are all just growing day in and day out. And I just pray that that sensitivity she has to just in moments of temptation, in moments where it's easy to go back to the old life, she would continue to look to Jesus. That every time she considers the cross, she would recognize what was done for her, what was done so that she could be free, and every day she would find more and more of that freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would just anoint her in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you bless her as a mother, as she raises her children, and we're believing that one day they too will be in this baptism tank, and we will and we'll baptize them as well. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Next, this is, Ju I want to make sure I pronounce this, Julie Finnerty, right? Julie Finnerty. And her and her husband are actually being baptized together today, and we're so excited for that. And how long have you guys been attending Bethel now? Uh, several years. Several years, yep. It's eight, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> They've been attending here, and it's been so great, you know, coming out of COVID. I've seen both of them serving. They're both joining some different serve teams right now, and it is clear that God is moving in their heart and life. And Julie, today, what is your confession of faith? I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I was baptized as a child, and I just want to recommit myself to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you extend your hand out to Julie this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for Julie. We thank you for her husband who is also going to be baptized. And we thank you for what you are doing in their lives. We thank you for every blessing, for every ounce of grace that you've poured upon them. But most of all, we thank you that you have rescued them, that you have saved them. Is what we were talking about, what Pastor Kurt was saying this morning. Lord, no matter what happens in our lives, we can look back and know that you saved us. That is what we celebrate, that you've rescued us today. And I just pray, Lord, that today again would be a special day for her, but it also would be a day that challenges her to continue to grow. You know, baptism is is not the end. Baptism is the beginning. It is the beginning of an incredible relationship with you that might take us in different twists and turns and all different trials, but in the end it is all worth it because we know that in you we stand eternally. And so I just pray that you would bless her, that you would bless her here in this church, bless her as a wife, bless her in her relationships, and we just pray that in everything she would continue to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right, and now this is Julie's husband, uh, John, who is coming today and uh, just excited to be here with him and his wife as they celebrate together. And John, what is your confession of faith today? I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And uh, again, I'm just so thankful for him and for his wife. And I just think them being baptized together is just, it's really at the heart of what our church is about. We are about families coming together in the name of Jesus. That is what it is about. And so I'm just thankful. Would you extend your hand out to John? Heavenly Father, I thank you today for John and again for Julie who have come together to be baptized. I thank you for the, um, the way you have moved in their life that has brought them to this day. And I just pray that, they, that he would continue to trust you, that he would continue to pursue you. Lord, in the darkest days, in the days of question, in the days of fear, I pray that he would continue to turn his head towards you. I pray that you would bless him as a husband, that you would give him wisdom as he leads his home. And I pray that together they would be a light to other couples, to other families of what can happen when you put your trust and faith in Jesus. I pray you'd use them in their workplaces, use them in their community, and we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. John, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Definitely going to need your help on this one. He's a lot taller, a lot taller than me. But this is Ben, uh, Ben Sykes. Um, he is married to Sarah. Um, Sarah Sykes. Her family has attended here for many years. And you started coming maybe what three years ago or so? Yeah, about that. About three years. And uh, Ben is just an amazing, amazing man of God. Um, I've gotten to know him a little bit more the last couple of weeks. I've been able to come out to Friday night youth group, and I see him interacting with our students. And and sometimes the way. The way someone interacts with kids and students shows a lot about where their heart is before the Lord. And I can tell that Ben loves the Lord, that he loves the next generation, he loves his family, and he's, God is doing something powerful in his life. So Ben, what is your confession of faith today? Well, I'm just uh, very joyful to be here before all of you and my family. And I confess and proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Amen. 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 Would you extend your hand this morning? Precious Father, we just thank you again for this day, and I thank you for Ben. And um, Lord, I can just tell, as we all can, that you have just moved in his life. And this is just such a powerful moment, as it should be. You know, baptism is, we don't believe that there's any saving that happens in baptism, but it is symbolic of a transformation that has taken place in our lives. And that should bring us to tears. It should bring us to great emotions because we recognize that without you, Lord, we are lost. Without you, we truly have nothing. But in you, we have found everything. In you, we have found life, we have found forgiveness, and we have found hope for the future. And I just pray that your greatest blessings would be upon Ben, not only today, but every day moving forward. Would you bless him as a husband, give him grace and wisdom to love his wife well and to lead his family well. Lord, to any children that you bring into their lives, Lord, may he be the father that raises his children up in the fear of the Lord. Bless him, Lord, in his place of work. Use him to be a light and a witness. Bless him as he invests in our students here at Bethel Church. Would he use his testimony and what you've done in his life to make an impact in theirs? We just ask, Lord, that he would continue to grow, to trust in you, to put his whole faith in you. And we ask this in Jesus' powerful and mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now, Ben, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you? Good, good, good. So we had a very powerful, powerful time in our first service. We had six individuals baptized in our first service. We've got four that are going to be baptized today. And we're starting with Elijah Mauser. Can everyone wave to Elijah? Can you wave to everybody, Elijah? <laughs> and this is the son of um, Jason and Jackie Mauser. And they've been attenders of our church for a long time. And, you know, I know sometimes when young, young children are baptized, everyone just kind of wonders, is this true? Is it authentic? But I just want you guys to know that over the last couple of weeks, Elijah has spent time with Pastor Kurt, myself, our children's uh, director, Melina, and we are absolutely certain that he has sensed a sensitivity to the Lord. And even though maybe he can't you know, tell us all of these incredible testimonies, we know that God has touched his heart and that he has a plan and purpose for his life. And so we're excited to baptize Elijah this morning. So Elijah, or you were telling me this morning, what is your confession of faith today? That Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> Many of you guys know Jason and Jackie, and they are doing just some incredible um, missions work here at the church, and I'm thankful that Elijah and his sister are going to grow up in a home that values the kingdom of God and that is going to keep putting the gospel in front of them. And so we're excited today. Can you stretch your hands out so we can pray for Elijah this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and all of your blessings. And God, there truly should be nothing that excites us more than when our children and our students are following you and are going public with their faith. Lord, no matter what their world may tell them, there is no greater life than the life that is following Jesus. There is no life that is worth living if it's not living for Christ. And so we just pray for Elijah right now that your hand would be upon him, that your Holy Spirit would come upon him, and that, Lord, as he grows, as he continues to learn, as he begins to open his Bible and he spends time listening to his teachers, to his parents, that you would just continue to become more and more real to him. I pray that you would protect him against the dangers of this world. I pray that you would protect him against the lies of the enemy. And may he grow to be a true, mighty man of God. I pray that you'd give great strength to his family as they continue to raise him and his sister, that you would just use them to do mighty things as a family. And we're just believing that we're gonna watch him grow, we're gonna watch him thrive, and we're going to eventually see him leading people to these same baptism waters. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The next one we have, this is Andrew Woods, and uh, this is really, really cool. I got to hang out with Andrew a little bit this week, but um, Andrew's wife has been attending our church now for a little bit, and Andrew, this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, your very first time in our building. He discovered our church through his family. He's been watching online during COVID, and today, in fact, when he walked in here, um, I, I just said, you, you can just go set up by the baptism tank, and he said, well, I don't even know where that is because today is his very first time. But over quarantine, online, God moved powerfully in his life. Amen. We've, uh, we've just been blown away as a staff. You know, in a year where church had to shut down and where everything looked different, we wondered what kind of ministry would happen 
And throughout all of this, we are seeing people saved, delivered, healed, and transformed by the power of the gospel. Because the gospel is not about a building. The gospel is about a movement by the Holy Spirit. And so we're just thankful for Andrew. And uh, Andrew, today, what is your confession of faith? I confess that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Andrew and I, we had a great conversation the other day, and I can just sense that God's doing something powerful in his life and his family who got to be here this morning. So we're just excited. Can you stretch your hand out so we can pray for Andrew today? Heavenly Father, I thank you today for Andrew. I thank you for bringing him here this morning. I thank you that in a year just filled with uncertainty when church looked different, that Lord, none of that mattered. You went and found him on your own. We thank you that you made a way, and we're just thankful that Bethel Church was able just to be part of that great story that you're writing in his life. But Lord, more than anything, we thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ that has saved Andrew, has set him on a new path, and is moving him forward day in and day out. And I just pray that each day he would just recommit to following you, to serving you. That every day he would give you his fears, his anxieties, that he would give you the cares of his life, and he would just trust that you are working it all out. We pray that you would just continue to help him as he dives into his Bible, as he begins to attend here regularly, as he gets around great community of other men. We just pray that you would help him to grow daily in his walk with you. We pray that you would give him strength as a father and as a husband, that you would bless him, and that this next season that he's entering into, no matter where it may lead him, would be the most fruitful yet, because you are the one leading him there. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. So now, Andrew, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, this is Chase, and um, it's really, really cool. Um, Chase and his mom, they're getting baptized together, which is really, really exciting. Amen. <laughs> they're going to be baptized together. And um, I've only gotten to know Chase a little bit, but the last couple Friday nights, I've been able to hang out with the students here um, at our youth group, and I've seen Chase there, and he's engaging, and he's worshiping, and I can clearly see that God is moving in Chase and his mom. And so, Chase, this morning, what is your confession of faith? I confess that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, um, and I just want to thank him for everything that he's done for me in my life. Amen. Amen, Chase. Would you guys extend your hands so we can pray for Chase this morning? Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for Chase. I'm thankful that you brought him and his mom to our church so that we could be here to celebrate on this amazing moment. God, I'm thankful that at his young age you have just already touched his heart, that you have revealed to him the wonderful grace and mercy that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we prayed before, Lord, he is stepping in, not even stepping, he is living in a world that is going to pull him every direction other than towards you. But we just pray that you would give him the grace and the wisdom to see through it all and find that you are truly the only way. That he would find, even at his age, that you are his all and all. That he does not need to go searching anywhere else to find fulfillment, to find satisfaction, to find hope or to find anything else, all he needs to do is run to you. And I pray that every day he would spend time crying out to you, that he would develop a wonderful relationship with your word and with you through prayer. We pray that you'd bless him here in our student ministry, that you would just continue to bring around him some wonderful friends and godly leaders that will lead him forward each and every day. And we are just looking forward over the years to seeing how you're going to use and move and chase his life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, Chase, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
All right, and now this is Chase's mom, Melissa. And you guys, if I remember, right around Easter time is where you guys started attending the church, correct? Actually, um, the, the last time at baptism. Okay, the last baptism. Okay, so yeah, a yes. little bit before Easter. And uh, Melissa and I have had a couple great conversations normally after service right there in the front. Uh, she's waiting and she and I have talked a few times and uh, every time it's been encouraging. I know that God is moving in her life and we're just thankful to have her as part of our community, part of the kingdom of God together. Um, she's going to begin serving soon. She went through our next program. And so we're just really thankful for her and her son. And so Melissa, I'm oh, sorry. It is Melissa. I, my, mine went blank there for a second, <laughs> but I was right. Uh, Melissa, what is your confession of faith today? Well, um, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, um, and I just, I just wanted to say a little something. It's very quick, um, but I just feel I need to do it for the Lord, um, that my personal testimony, my own personal life testimony, is nothing short of a picture of God's faithfulness and powerful love. Abuse and trauma uh, were the theme of my childhood, uh, followed by a deep-rooted pain and the effects of PTSD, um, which led to a lifestyle of sin, obviously, for many, many years. But God. Now all I see in my past is the goodness of God, and He is worthy. Amen. 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 That's that's what it's all about. If if you had to if you had to sum up the Bible in two words, but God, that's what that's what it is. We were lost, but God. We had no hope, but God. That is the story. That's the story of the gospel. And so I'm just before I even pray, I just want to share share with anyone who's who's watching here online, no matter what you're facing, no matter how hard it may be. No matter how bleak, no matter how um, lost you may feel, but God, God is able. God can do enough. Would you stretch your hands out and let's pray for Melissa today. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for Melissa, for her son Chase, and for bringing them here to our community. Lord, I thank you for what you've done in her life. And I'm so thankful that she's able to look back over a lifetime of pain and hurt and despite it all, she's able to worship the name of Jesus because she realizes that all of that, as we, as we read in 2 Corinthians, the old has passed away, and behold, all things are brand new. In Jesus, the memory may still be there, but now we realize the newness that you have brought. We see how you've moved despite our pain, despite our circumstances. And God, I'm thankful that you have brought her here today where she can proclaim to this church and to the world through church online that God is able and that God is enough. And our great prayer is that from today moving forward, she would just continue to cling to the God who has brought her through it all, that she would continue to trust in you, that every day she would just uh, surrender her life, her decisions, everything to the kingdom of God. We pray that you would bless her and her son. Bless her as a mother as she just raises her son to follow you. We pray that you would surround her with some wonderful, wonderful, mighty women of God at this church. May she know she never has to do anything by herself. That we are a family here at Bethel. And that whatever she goes through, we're all going through it together. And that we are here to support her in any way we can. We just pray you lead her, guide her, and direct her. And we're just looking forward to the incredible stories and testimonies that are to come. And we thank you, Lord, for everyone who was baptized today. And we're looking forward to this brand new season as our building is opening up again, as we are able to start doing ministry the way you desired. We're believing that more and more people are going to be saved, that more and more lives are going to be transformed. We're believing for healings. We're believing for deliverance. We're believing that marriages are coming back together. We're believing that fear has no place. We are believing that this community, this neighborhood, is going to be radically transformed. We're believing for services where we just have people lined up out the door coming to be baptized. We're believing for days like in Acts chapter 2, when 3,000 people were saved in one day. 
and they were baptized. We're just believing that as a new day is dawning here and around this country, that we're going to see miracles. That we're going to see things we've never seen before. And we just believe it. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand to your feet and give God all the praise. Come on. Put your... Hallelujah. Just lift your hands. We're going to just sing a song. We're going to go right into communion. You want to go ahead? Or you want, to, want me to go into communion first? I'm going to do communion. <laughs> I like that. She said, you're the boss. Let's do communion first. Okay. <laughs> you just take your communion cup here with us. And um, I'm just going to read this text here quickly. This is again from 1 Corinthians 11. I don't need to say anything else. Paul said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we just are just overwhelmed. What a morning we've had. Lord, the word that you've challenged us with, but each one of these powerful testimonies of salvation and transformation that has taken place. And it's all because of the sacrifice that you made for us. Father, I pray that we would all search our hearts today and that we would make sure that we receive this in a worthy manner. First of all, we thank you for making us worthy through the grace of God. But I pray that there would not be anything willful within us that would make it unworthy. That, Lord, we would be peacemakers. That we would always seek to honor the sacrifice of Christ that you've made for all mankind. That we would not be divisive. That we would not be those who seek to make trouble, whisperers, that we would see ourselves as elite or better than anyone else. We are all saved by the grace of God. And may we always demonstrate that. May we receive this body today, this bread, in remembrance of you, in Jesus' name. Let's partake together. Thank you, Jesus. Now, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes again. Oh, Lord, I love that last part. We do this as a testimony that we believe you are coming again. And if you're coming again, then you're alive. <laughs> you rose from the dead. And so this cup reminds us not only of a Christ who died for us, but who rose again and has ascended to the Father and ever lives to intercede for us that our faith would not fail, but that we would overcome. Father, we thank you for the word that says, these things I have written to you that you sin not. But should you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Oh Lord, I pray that there would not be one among us today that would be overwhelmed with condemnation. Because, Lord, you have provided a means by which we can be forgiven, and I'm thankful for it. So I pray that today we'd run to you the author and the finisher of our faith. And may we receive this cup with great thanksgiving in our heart for all that you've done. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen and amen. Let's partake of it together. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord.